So <clears throat> turns out that I, I, I overdid the slides, or, or maybe I just spoke too much this morning. So um, there's a really excellent, I, I, I want to alert you to an issue that has come up recently that the USPTO has given some guidance on uh, that you should be aware of. And it deals specifically with the situation where uh, you as an attorney are dealing not directly with your client, but you're dealing through some sort of an intermediary, a middleman. Um, now we talked earlier today about where that middleman is a foreign associate and whether that's a client or not a client, right? But there are other situations where you could be dealing with someone who is a quote unquote intermediary. Um, there is some guidance that the PTO has published with regard to the ethics issues involved when dealing with so-called intermediaries. But I just wanted to alert you to it because the OED talks to people about it as if they ought to know these things, but you won't find this stuff unless you are really looking for it. It's a really, it's a needle in a haystack. And the, and the two primary sources of law that the OED points to, uh, and I've been in these meetings where they've spoken about it, is a 1987, okay, we're in 2017, I think, all right, 30 year old OG notice and a 29 year old OG notice. So we'll call them the 1987 OG notice and the 1988 OG notice. And those OG notices, just to sort of cut to the chase, when the PTO promulgated its ethics rules in 1985, there was a lot of concern about attorney, from attorneys who were worried about, well, how can we deal with our foreign associates in light of these rules now? Because we get a lot of business from overseas. And one of the rules says that we can't accept compensation from someone other than a client. And if these third party middlemen are compensating us and we're billing them, then that's gonna be a problem. And it also, the rules say that we have to exercise our independent professional judgment. And so how are we going to exercise our independent professional judgment when we are in effect going out to these intermediaries and saying, give us your instructions on what to do. We're asking them to tell us what to do and we're not providing the advice and isn't that a problem? And so the um, then USPTO commissioner, um, from 1987 issued an OG notice that talked about when it was appropriate for uh, a US law firm to uh, get instructions from and get paid from an intermediary. Um, and they, they use the term client liaison or foreign associate. Now, I understand what foreign associate means. Um, I have a difference of understanding and opinion as to what client liaison means because client liaison is a very generic term and it can mean a lot of different things. Um, but essentially what the, o, uh, what the USPTO did was carve out some, uh, some ethical latitude for US practitioners, specifically when they're dealing with foreign clients to enable them to gain instructions from clients as well as to, to engage in the payment relationship with uh, the, the intermediaries and dealing with intermediaries. Now there's something in the OG notice that I just wanted to point this out to you because I was, I was just in a meeting in DC with a bunch of in-house counsel and it seems like this, this rule is honored in its breach. The, the rule is that you can take instructions from a foreign associate or intermediary as long as the client gives full informed consent. And, and I asked the people in the room, well, how many of you go to the foreign associate and ask for proof that the client has given full informed consent? Um, and there were, no hands were raised. No one does this. As a matter of course, no one does this. Um, I have not seen it become grounds for discipline for a US practitioner in dealing in this context, but it is the law that instructions uh, are, if, if without, the, without the informed consent of the client, said another way, without the informed consent of the client, the lawyer is required to communicate directly 
to the client. They cannot deal through the intermediary. There is a presumption when there's a foreign associate involved that the U.S. that the foreign associate has received such consent from uh, the foreign client. As a practical matter, though, it's one of those things that no one asks for and no one gets. And I think many clients would probably feel insulted, or certainly many foreign associates would feel insulted if you went to them and said, oh, by the way, can you show us the proof that you got, you gave informed consent to your end client that will enable us to do, no one ever really does that. But, and I've never seen anyone disciplined for this. Um, the issue comes up though, because there have been a, a number of cases and I, I cite this case called Inri My, My Hakalova from uh, this year, which was a USPTO disciplinary case. It involved an intermediary, uh, an intermediary dealing between a, a US patent agent and their inventor clients. The intermediary in this case, though, wasn't a foreign associate. It was a, an invention marketing company. And the, um, the PTO, actually did a very nice job in this case. It's not very well publicized. You won't find this decision on Lexis or Westlaw. But they actually did, I thought, a very nice job of at least talking about the ethics rules that are implicated when you're dealing with a middleman and to be mindful of these different rules because dealing with the middleman could implicate conflicts of interest, um, business conflicts, personal interest conflicts, could potentially be issues of fee splitting if you're sharing your fee with the middleman for the legal services, whether the middleman is unduly uh, influencing your own independent professional judgment. Um, and the big one, client communications, and whether the client is understanding what their options are what the benefits are of pursuing a particular course, be it applying for a provisional application or providing for a design application or a non-provisional application. In Ray Michaelova deals with a bunch of different issues and it's a, that could be an hour lecture in and of itself. I'm not gonna go into that now because we wanna cover other grounds. The duty of supervision is one that's something that's really, really very important at the PTO, and they take this stuff very seriously. So we've got sort of three levels of, of, of uh, supervisory ethics rules that apply depending upon what your station is. If you're a manager in a law firm or a manager or the equivalent in an in-house counsel position, you've got sort of this overriding uh, strict liability duty that uh, you know, kind of a buck stops here thing. Whether you were involved in some uh, malfeasance or not, the issue is, you know, whether you took reasonable efforts to ensure that the organization is doing things in compliance with the ethics rules. Um, <clears throat> there are ethics duties that apply to um, <clears throat> whether you're. Uh, uh, the most senior partner in your firm, whether you're the most junior associate. Um, you have supervisory duties with respect to the actions of um, so-called non-practitioner assistants, which is, you know, your, the paralegals, um, typically paralegals, secretaries, support staff, anyone who's not a, an attorney or an agent. Um, same uh, language, duty to assure that um, reasonable efforts are made to ensure that the non-practitioner assistants are conducting themselves in accordance with the rules of ethics. So that, for example, you can't have uh, your uh, paralegal do something that would be unethical if you were to do it. Um, it would, you can't just sort of pass the buck on to that person. It ultimately would fall back on you. Um, and this, so this, this applies to um, subordinate practitioners as well. We'll call subordinate practitioners, again, if you are um, not in the management structure, um, but you have, uh, if you are aware of ethical misconduct by other practitioners, including people more senior than you, um, you have an obligation to do something about it. Um, 
it, it, it may very well be that your obligation is to report it to, to someone at your firm. Um, it can be a very delicate and, uh, and, and, and tough um, conversation to have, but turning a blind eye is, is not an option. Um, it might be require you to go outside of your, your firm and seek independent counsel as to whether or not uh, if you see some things going on in your organization that don't seem right to you, that, that seem unethical to you, or that you believe to be unethical, um, turning a blind eye to it is not a defense. You don't have a defense just because you're a subordinate, unless it's an issue where there's a debatable question and uh, there's an arguable question and a reasonable resolution to that question. Um, that might be a safe harbor. Um, another, in the supervisory mode, uh, there's a case I wanted to alert you about. It's called In Race Wires. So there was a company in North Carolina called the Trademark Company. Some of you may have heard of them before. They were a massive filer, trademark applications. They were like one of the top five for several years. Matt Swires was a trademark examiner, started his own firm, a, a one-person firm, with it, it was him and like 12 paralegals. And um, I guess he got, he, he was a victim of his success in the sense that uh, he had so many cases and so many applications coming through that he s essentially delegated his responsibilities to his non attorney support staff, including things like having uh, paralegals provide direct legal advice to clients. Um, non-attorneys uh, signing his name to uh, documents for filing in the USPTO, uh, just a complete uh, dereliction of his own duties in allowing the others that were working in his firm to um, conduct uh, the uh, to, to conduct the practice. And uh, Swires, uh, Swires is no longer able to um, sign or file uh, patent app or trademark applications in the USPTO. He ended up after a very lengthy investigation resigning from the USPTO. Um, but it's a very interesting case. One thing that is, and, and this is a very, it's odd to me as a federal practitioner, as a, f a federal litigator with the S signature. Right? I don't know how many of you do deal with S signatures but as a matter of course, in, in certainly in federal court pleadings, I don't, you know, necessarily, I'm not the one that's sitting there typing in the backslash S, backslash, I mean, we've got like a block signature form that's stuck at the end that some, you know, someone prepares the template of the paper for filing, and I might work on the body of the document, but I'm not necessarily going to be the one that does the signature. I always screw up the underlining and it looks double bolded in certain places that somebody else enters it. Right? And it's no big deal. I'm blessing, I'm certifying it's a good faith filing. Um, but the PTO has a very specific rule on S signatures and the rule is that the practitioner themselves must do the backslash S backslash. Even if you don't do any other portion of the paper, the entering of the signature it can be, you can delegate that to another practitioner. So you're not in the office, you can have another practitioner sign your name for you, but you can't have your assistant, your paralegal, your whatever you want to call them that's not a, a practitioner, do the enter your name and for you. Now that again, this may be one of those rules that's violated in the, it, as a matter of course, but I've seen it come up and it came up in the Swires investigation because they asked him, of these 15,000 applications, which ones of these did you enter your signature in and which ones of these you didn't? <laughs> That's, uh, okay. That's a hard one. But, but literally the rule says, which I think I find it to be an absurd rule, frankly, because when you're signing something, uh, when you're filing something, your submission is what's important and you're certifying per rule 11.18, you're certifying that you have a good faith basis for doing it. But the mechanical act of actually you being the person that has to sit there and literally do the backslash S backslash um, seems to be a bit of um, 
a surreal absurdity, especially when the non-practitioner could write up the whole office action response. That's okay. They could write up the whole thing, but you have to be the person that actually signs it. You can't delegate the signature. So just an FYI, if it ever comes up. There's a, a new process that just went into play at the PTO when we're speaking of discipline, uh, a program that uh, was um, started this, just this past month, the beginning of November, that I just wanted to let you know about called Disciplinary Divergence. And the, the, the concept behind divergence is that, uh, well, frankly, there's a lot of substance and alcohol abuse and use in the practice of law. Um, there was a 2015 ABA um, Betty Ford Clinic s study of 15,000 lawyers that uh, came up with a, a, a huge number of uh, percentage of practicing attorneys who have um, alcohol, alcohol or substance abuse disorder issues, like something like three or four times more than the general population, something like 30% of practitioners uh, who admit to, those are the ones that are admitting to it. And, and on the drugs use side, it's probably underreported. But um, as a result of this, you know, there are certain times that things happen that are really uh, the result of someone's abuse of alcohol or drugs. And, um, and the real root problem isn't so much that they're bad people or bad lawyers, but they just have, they have, a, they have a problem. And the, a lot of states have recognized this and have created something called a divergence program. And these, this is designed for sort of lesser offenses. If you've done something wrong, but it's not like kind of death sentence wrong, um, and you suffer from uh, a, a medical condition, mental health issue, uh, you may be able to qualify for a diversion from discipline as uh, instead of going through a normal disciplinary route where, the, where you're actually getting treated for your uh, whatever it is that happens to be the problem that led to the um, uh, whatever it was that you, that you missed. Now, does that mean that if you stole client funds to fund your crack habit, um, you're not going to be able to get diverted out of that. Um, but if you missed a filing date because of your crack habit, and you know it's something that doesn't cause irreparable harm to the client, it can be fixed. Um, and uh, and in certain circumstances, that could be uh, potentially appropriate for um, treating the lawyer and putting them through a, a different type of disciplinary uh, or different type of a system. So just something to keep in mind. Um, I know I don't know what Iowa is doing in this regard, but about 30 states, uh, 30 state bars so far have similar types of diversion programs. Again, it's not a free pass. If you steal, if you cheat, if you're engaged in serious dishonesty, if you commit a felony, you're not going to divert yourself away from discipline. But if you get a DWI, for example, that's something that you need to report to the OED, actually. If you get, if you get convicted of, a, 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 let's say, a, a driving while under the influence offense, and they will do investigate those things, and they want to determine whether there's an ongoing act of abuse, and then they'll start looking at your docket. They'll start saying, you know, oh, these, there's all of these abandoned cases on your, you know, what happened there? Was the client informed? They know sort of what are the signs to look for um, that cause them to investigate. Perhaps there is a substance issue going on here. There's a been they can find like a systematic failure to communicate. Once they start looking, um, they can put those pieces together and it at least raises the issue. So I view it as a positive because you don't really want to go through discipline if you don't have to. And honestly. If it, if it really is, this is one area where I criticize the OED a lot in a lot of other things, but in this particular space, I, I do kind of applaud them because I've had a number of clients who suffer from addictions and, you know, they, they this is a perfect program for them because they really shouldn't, they, they, not having this before, um, it, it kind of is like you're either, you know, you're punished because of your addiction or there's nothing in between. So now at least there's some flexibility there. 
Um, I want to go on now to malpractice um, and how those the the connection between malpractice and ethics. Different different issues. The ethics rules dictate the professional norms. Um, violation of an ethics rule does not mean that you committed malpractice. Violation of an ethics rule means that you might be subject to attorney discipline, but it doesn't mean malpractice per se. To have malpractice, you have to have an attorney-client relationship. Remember we talked about the client thing. Um, a breach of the duty of care, uh, causation, and damages. And where the ethics issue often arises is the defining what is the duty of care. Um, if you breach the ethics duty, did you breach the duty of care? In many jurisdictions, ethical rules inform what the duty of care is, what the standard of care is, and so proving the violation of at least that element of legal malpractice um, uh, directly ties to, in many cases, the ethics rules. Um, two things that aren't, though, tied with ethics, but those are additional requirements for legal mal, are causation and damages. And, and, and those are the ones that make legal malpractice claims so difficult to prevail on as a plaintiff. You might have a very strong case that your patent or trademark attorney really screwed things up for you, um, violated all kinds of ethics rules, uh, were disbarred for violating all kinds of ethics rules, but were still unable to prove that that violation of the ethics rule in and of itself was the proximate causation of the harm. So I'm going to show you some examples of how this has played up. Um, one is in a situation where we have um, uh, so-called subject matter conflicts of interest. Uh, you may all have heard of the law firm of Finnegan Henderson. Uh, Back in around 2011, Finnegan Henderson was representing two different clients at the same time uh, for uh, an inventions related to um, screwless eyewear, eyeglass connectors. Um, in Finnegan's Boston office, they were representing a guy named Malling. Uh, in Finnegan's DC office, they were representing a Japanese company called Masnuga Optical. Um, both clients, in separate offices, got their patents prosecuted through different attorneys in the different offices. Both clients got their own patents. Um, one wasn't cited against the other. The other wasn't cited against the other. One wasn't, you know, 102 or 103 to each other. They both had their own inventions that were separately patentable uh, in their own space. Now that space was screwless eyewear. Um, Malling alleged, he sued Malling, when Malling learned that Finnegan had also prosecuted patent applications for Massanuga, Malling sued Finnegan for legal malpractice, alleging that, but for your violation of your duty of loyalty to me, um, I lost out on business and marketing opportunities because now Massanuga has a patent and I had, I had, um, opportunities to sell my patented product and now I can't sell it because you got a patent for uh, or you got patents for Massanuga and so that was the subject matter of the lawsuit um, and it ended up going to the, the, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts uh, which uh, took on the question of when is when is it uh, potentially cause for a malpractice for a, an IP firm to represent uh, two clients in the quote-unquote same technical space. Now, that was, this was an issue of great concern, and it is an issue of great concern to many lawyers, because many of us represent more than one client in the quote-unquote same technical space, whatever that means. And um, there was a big push by the patent bar to make sure that uh, the, the Massachusetts court was aware that same technical space is not uh, a useful term and, it's, and that is not a, a piece of law that you want to have out on the books, um, that you could have many independently invented products that are, that are um, uh, separately patentable and they could be for even for competitors and that doesn't 
uh, create a cause of action for malpractice. Ultimately, the Supreme Court of, of Massachusetts agreed with the, the Finnegan argument that these two uh, sets of patents were not, um, they did not cause a subject matter conflict of interest because both clients got what they asked for. They both got the same claims that they asked for. They both got the patents that they wanted. Um, so there was no proximate causation or no plausible allegation that Malling was proximately harmed simply by the virtue of the fact that the same law firm got uh, patents for an alleged competitor that also dealt with uh, a different solution to the same problem. Um, the takeaway from uh, the Malling case that has also been taken away and has been adopted as doctrine at the OED, although not in any published way, but uh, they've told me this in many different investigations, is, is uh, I guess it would be dicta, but it's, uh, it's dicta that's being followed, um, that on the issue of subject matter conflicts that law firms in the IP space have an obligation as part of their conflict checking process to implement processes and procedures for identifying subject matter conflicts. They don't say how, but they just say it, it is necessary. Um, they use the word robust to describe the processes. They don't explain what robust means, but they used it twice in two sentences, two separate sentences. So it must mean something really important. So you need to have a robust process that will detect potential conflicts for conflicting subject matter. And they mentioned that firms run significant risks if they don't avail themselves of robust conflict systems adequate to the nature of their practice. Um, again, the OED, I've been involved in many investigations and um, the OED will ask the lawyers in the firm, what, what's the system that you have in place for contact for identifying um, subject matter conflicts. Um, so they treat it as binding. Um, and just to give you a sort of an example of how subject matter conflicts comes up in a case where it would actually be a, a subject matter conflict is a case that was discussed in Malling called Sentinel v. Platt. In that particular case there were two different inventors two different inventive entities that came to the same law firm within like a couple of weeks of one another. One was a former employee, came to a law firm with a particular invention. The ex-employer also came to that same law firm with almost the identical invention. They were assigned to the same associate to work on. The associate testified that he did not see the patentable, any patentable difference between the inventions. Um, one was cited against the other as prior art, uh, the law firm had to narrow the claims for one of the client's patents to gain allowance over the other client's patents. And so that was a real subject matter conflict issue. That, that was the type of a case where you are now narrowing the scope of a claim for one client because of a claim space that you've carved out for a different client. The Sentinel case was a malpractice case. Sentinel uh, lost the malpractice case, not because of the conflict of interest, but they couldn't prove but for causation. Essentially, the, the court said, well, you know, even though all of this stuff was, you know, it was probably a violation of the ethics rule, there's no evidence that if you'd been represented by conflict-free counsel that there wouldn't have been the same result. And so, no causation court, the case is dismissed. And that thematically, you see that in a lot of different cases in a lot of different contexts. Um, uh, in a, a very recent case in Texas deals with the same issue. It was um, Access International versus Baker Botts. Same sort of fact scenario. Law firm uh, is representing two different clients in the space of active radio frequency technology. Legal malpractice case comes out because um, there's issues of both clients getting patents at the same time, covering similar technologies. The jury awards $41 million for legal malpractice. 
against Baker Botts. Um, the, the, uh, the state trial court uh, took, the, took it away from the jury and granted judgment as a matter of law in favor of the law firm on the basis of the statute of limitations. And on appeal, the Texas Court of Appeals uh, affirmed the, the judgment in favor of Baker Botts, but not on statute of limitations grounds, but on proximate causation grounds. So it was, it's an interesting look at it, but the, it, the, the, the uh, appellate court in Texas said, you offered, they looked at the evidence of proximate causation and what was relied upon at trial was expert testimony about what could have happened with, with conflict-free counsel. And um, the Texas court said, eh, what could have happened isn't what's relevant, it's what would have happened that's relevant. You needed to present better evidence of not just what possibility there was, but what probability there was. And the, the court also noted that the, um, the expert for that was used by the plaintiff in that case was not, a, it was really an interference issue and the, the expert testimony was provided by someone that didn't have any background or experience in, um, in interferences. And so uh, the, the, the court there found absence of proximate causation. So no soup for uh, the company there. Uh, again, tough cases to win. Negligent prosecution. Um, all kinds of manner of negligent prosecution cases and, and really the biggest issues that come up that, uh, that the PTO sees or the, the OED sees are uh, either failure to communicate, poor communications. If you have to put them in two baskets, it's poor communications with the client and or uh, poor systems and controls over your own internal systems for docketing and, and supervision. Those are the two primary causes of ethics complaints. They are also the two primary causes of malpractice actions. Um, multiple examples of, of how failure to communicate or failure to docket appropriately ended up in attorney discipline. Um, I did want to talk to you about, in, in the malpractice context, uh, an interesting case is Protostorm versus Antonelli Krauss. Now, Antonelli Krauss was a law firm in Alexandria, Virginia that was around, was around for many, many, many years. They don't exist anymore because of this case. Um, so that's a spoiler alert. Uh, uh, fact, factual background, 2000, provisional application filed. Uh, June 2001, a PCT application is filed. The, um, the law firm designates everybody, every country in the world except for three. They don't, uh, they accept out Mongolia, they accept out um, Zaire, and they accept out the United States of America. <laughs> now, I don't know why the U.S. of A. wasn't included, but that was a slight hiccup, an oversight. And I'm sorry, it wasn't Zim Zaire, it was Zimbabwe. My apologies. So they got a different Z country. I think it was Zimbabwe. It was one of those. It was down there somewhere. Mongolia, Zimbabwe, U.S. of A. But the rest of the world are good. <laughs> so client doesn't know anything about this, they're, uh, they're an NPA, non-practicing entity, I'm not very sophisticated, several years go by and they say, oh, Google seems to be practicing our invention, um, why don't we assert our patent against Google? And the law firm says, what patent? Oh, we never designated the USA, whoops. Um, so negligence lawsuit is filed, Case goes on, it's a very long case, goes on, it's, it's litigated in the Southern District of New York for many years. Um, at the end of the day, in 2014, jury awards $8 million in, um, uh, in damages to Protostorm for Antonelli's uh, negligence. Um, right around the time, well, the while the trial was going on, or just before the trial in the case started, 
Alice came out. The Alice decision came out. Now, this patent under Alice, dead. Dead. This was a business method patent. Dead. Okay? But the law firm didn't raise Alice as a defense to the malpractice claim. The, the, the issue would be, all right, yeah, we, we screwed up. We messed up. But, you know, there's no proximate causation here because under Alice, you just didn't have patentable subject matter anyway, and therefore you shouldn't have gotten a patent, and therefore you suffered no harm caused by our malpractice. Had you gotten a patent, it wouldn't have been valid anyway was essentially the theory. The problem was they didn't make that argument at the right time. They waited until um, basically it was too late, uh, raised it on, uh, hadn't didn't preserve the issue at the district court. And so on the post-judgment review, the court said, no, you waived that. And the Second Circuit affirmed. So the Alice issue was waived. You don't get the benefit from uh, trying to argue that Alice somehow uh, uh, is a defense to your uh, neg negligence. Um, and Antonelli has since shut down, and the damages have since accrued to something like $15 million because of interest. Now, here's how Alice works in another context. Again, another business method patent. And, and think about the time frames here that we're talking about. Look at the dates. In 1993, there's a priority application that's filed. Um, this is Encyclopedia Britannica. Does anybody here know what it, anyone here that's uh, under 40, have you ever heard of Encyclopedia Britannica? There used to be a thing called encyclopedias that's <laughs> before Google took them away. <laughs> um, but we had a set in our house. And so, but Encyclopedia Britannica had this online, they had a business method patent, okay? And 1993, there was a priority application that was filed that had a, a significant defect in it that went unnoticed. Uh, the disclosure issue that just went unnoticed. Patent is issued ultimately, uh, and um, Encyclopedia Britannica sues a third party for infringement. Uh, in 2009, the patents are found invalid due to this uh, the disclosure. And the, it was a 112 issue um, from the defects that went back to the original and was carried over. So um, EB loses, the Encyclopedia Britannica loses in the patent infringement case, so they turn around and they sue their lawyers who prosecuted the application. It's 16 Shapiro, which also was a, uh, a well-known DC-based law firm. Uh, Encyclopedia Britannica sues in, in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. The case there languishes for years, as these cases often do. And the D.C. Court is very slow. Um, they try several different ways to get the case dismissed. They have, they're not able to. And then Alice comes out, and they jump on Alice to file a motion for summary judgment. District Court says, yep, this, um, this patent was, or this patent never would have been issued because of the Alice decision, um, and therefore they grant summary judgment, and uh, the D.C. Circuit affirms. Now think about that for a second, because Alice was decided in 2014, right? The initial defect occurred in 21 years earlier, and the lawsuit occurred eight years earlier. The patents were invalidated in 2009, five years before Alice was even issued. And so you think, well, how do you get to get away with that over law that didn't even exist at the time? How does that work? Um, well, this is great, and I think you all appreciate this. The, D the district court says Alice didn't change the law. Alice just clarified what 101 meant. So... Um, Section 101 hasn't changed. Section 101 has always said what it says. And Alice merely clarified the interpretation of 101. And the DC Circuit says, yep, just a clarification. So I think there's a lot of people that would probably think that Alice was more than just a clarification. But in the DC District Court, uh, they were very happy to get rid of the case. And uh, they found Alice to, as a grounds for getting rid of it. The point is, Proximate causation 
has a very um, has has a has a very broad in, uh, concept, and you're not limited to attacking the patents. I mean, think about it. The the law firm Dickstein was attacking the very patents that it build its clients to prosecute. Now you might argue that well, it goes to your credibility. You know, on the one hand, you paid. You know, were you screwing them them when you took your money when you took their money to prosecute these patents that you're now saying are bad, or are you lying now about whether what your argument was about then? I mean, it seems like you want to have it both ways. Um, you're kind of dumping on your own work product. But in the malpractice context, the gloves come off. And if you're getting sued for malpractice, it, it, it often is the defense that, in fact, the, you, you never should have gotten that patent in the first place. And um, uh, it, uh, it seems like it's incongruous to allow the firm that prosecuted the case to also be able to make that def defense. Because remember, when they filed, the applications and prosecuted the application. They did so presumed to their oath under 1118 that they believed in good faith. All of this stuff was right and it was patentable and they had no reason not to believe it. Now they're kind of say they wanted to have it the other way, but um, it does happen quite a bit. It'll happen because of Alice. It'll happen because of other art that they find, you know, essentially they will do what, like what would happen in an, in an IPR which is reevaluate patentability, and they'll, they'll take a, a whack at the patent any way they can to avoid proximate causation, because that's a good defense. Negligent licensing. This is another interesting uh, issue that's come up, and, and uh, uh, the fact pattern is that there's a law firm in Chicago, uh, Vanek Vickers and Messini, um, they are representing a, a client called Metamorphix that um, develops a, um, an ergonomic keyboard for your computer. And they, uh, the law firm helps them negotiate a license agreement. They get a license from Microsoft with a lump sum payment of paid up license for $400,000, which maybe at the time seemed like it was a good idea until they sold $15 million of the um, patented, uh, that Microsoft sold the patented uh, uh, ergonomic uh, keyboards and then they thought, well, oh, 15, 400K, um, that's not really a lot. <laughs> we should have gotten more. And they went back and looked at their, at the license agreement and they found that, you know, the, oh, the license agreement was very poorly worded. It, it actually excluded from coverage of the license, essentially, um, what was covered by the patent. So, the un, as a matter of contract, Microsoft said, "Hey, we don't owe you any. Uh, whether these are covered by the patent or not, that's not the definition. You wrote the document. It's your document. We agreed that these would be the conditions under which we'd pay, and." Um, and so in a standard licensing agreement, at least one part of the test for whether something is royalty bearing or not is whether it falls within the scope of a claim. But that wasn't in this patent licensing agreement for, for some reason. The, initially, the trial court, uh, the, the uh, plaintiff loses at the trial court essentially because of uh, grounds for lack of causation that went back to trial court's decision to exclude certain expert testimony about Microsoft sales data. So without the sales data to support the damages claim, they had no evidence to support their claim for damages and proximate causation. Uh, the case went away. On the appeals court, uh, vacated decision and remanded it, said that the, uh, uh, that the client's expert testified that the license agreement fell below the standard of care, um, that that was appropriate testimony. It should not have been limited. And the Microsoft sales data was completely relevant and should have been admitted at trial. Um, and, um, and actually, what they're, they're thinking 30 million. It may have been 30 million of these were sold, not whatever the number I said before. 30 million of the keyboards were sold. They wanted like a dollar on each one instead of the ended up being, what, four cents or something for, for the number that they'd sold. Um, so 
there's negligence in there too, and that's kind of a, an issue of uh, you know in in licensing agreements, like everything else, um, you want to be uh, not you don't want to be a dabbler. Um, the people that were doing the license agreement at the law firm uh, were this was not they weren't really into doing a lot of licensing agreements, and I think they they left some some a serious gaping hole in their clients. Uh, protection um, that wasn't really understood by the client uh, until it was uh, until it was too late. Um, negligent litigation. Now this is a, a fairly easy one to see. Um, Sidley and Austin, very big, prominent national law firm, uh, very well respected. Represents AT and T in patent litigation. I believe the case is in Texas. Forty million dollar verdict. Um, Entered against um, uh, actually, with the, there was a forty million dollar verdict, not against Sidley. A forty million dollar verdict was rep, uh, was entered against uh, their client AT and T at the uh, district court in this patent infringement lawsuit. I think it was a, I think it was an Eastern District of Texas case. So, two way media wins a forty million dollar verdict uh, at the district court. Um, Post-trial motions are filed, as is the normal course, for uh, to turn or overturn the jury's verdict. Um, when the uh, the district court denies those motions, however, when they denied the motions, uh, are you are, are any of you familiar with Pacer? You, or use Pacer, get cases on Pacer. So when they get the the, the order comes across Pacer. The, the order itself that's in the caption on PACER is an order granting a motion to uh, seal certain documents or to file certain documents under seal. That's what the title of the order was. But actually attached to that order was the court's ruling denying all of um, AT&T's post-trial motions. And none of the 16 attorneys at Sidley and Austin, who were on the case, read the order. And so therefore they didn't know that once the, the so the, the for you non-litigators, the denial of the mo the post-trial motion starts the clock for noticing an appeal. They didn't know the clock had started because none of the 16 lawyers on the case ended up reading anything about it. They just thought this was just a pro forma. You know, you have these in patent cases all the time, uh, uh, order granting motion to uh, seal a particular document. And um, um, so the appeals clock ran, uh, and then it was too late. They blew their appeal deadline. Um, and so, uh, uh, Sidley argued on behalf of AT&T that um, this was excusable neglect. That you know they they it was just it was they sort of tried to blame it on Pacer or on the ECF system that uh, you know the, the the title of the order was was misleading and and therefore their neglect should be excused. They admitted neglect, um, but the fact they had 16 lawyers on the case kind of cut against them. And, um, you know, it's a kind of a good argument uh, or at least a good uh, reasoning from the court. It says, you know, you have a duty to read court orders. And, um, you know, this is a big pro, I mean, as an aside, it's a pretty high profile case. They just, I don't think they could get over the fact that there were so many lawyers working on the case. And that's just the lawyers whose names were entered into the system. That doesn't limit, you know, you always have, you know, paralegals and secretaries and other people who get copies on things. And so probably the order itself, it's just remarkable that it didn't get printed out and circulated, that somebody didn't actually read whatever came from the court. So Federal Circuit didn't really have much sympathy for um, AT&T. And um, what could have otherwise been just another non-practicing entity case that gets knocked out for Alice grounds or whatever um, from the Federal Circuit is survives. Now I said this is a negligent, uh, 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 a negligent act, a negligent malpractice, or a negligent 
litigation case. The fact pattern I've just read to you, this is all arose in the context of the underlying patent litigation. I don't believe AT&T sued Sidley and Austin. I'm fairly certain AT&T didn't need to sue Sidley and Austin. I'm fairly confident that Sidley and Austin made its client AT&T whole and no doubt wrote a big fat check because you know, it's a pretty smart business move and there's no real good defense to I'm not going to start arguing with AT&T about, um, about this issue. So the case doesn't make it into the media as a negligent uh, litigation case, but it is a, 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 a pretty good illustration about how um, l litigation can uh, lead to uh, negligence in our space and lots of ways of doing it. That's an easy one. I mean, blowing a deadline like that, you know, it's pretty hard to say with a straight face. They would look ridiculous and their reputational interests are such that, uh, you know, they wanted to make their client, I'm sure they wanted to make AT&T. I have no personal knowledge of that, but I'm guessing with Sidley, they've got a big insurance policy and they've got a big client. They want to make them happy. Um, so Octane Fitness. You all have heard of Octane Fitness, have you? It's had a little impact on our practice. It's impacted trademark law as well as patent law. Uh, <clears throat> what I have not seen yet, but what I am anticipating seeing is the following sort of fact pattern. Now we've got all of these cases that are coming out extraordinary number of cases that are coming out where attorneys fees are being awarded on grounds that uh, well frankly never would have been awarded before but now under Octane Fitness district courts finding a lot more um, leeway to um, award attorneys fees um, and what I think what we're going to be seeing in the near term are where in cases where clients have lost and have had to pay attorney's fees. Um, the language in the Octane Fitness or the language in the attorney's fees order, granting attorney's fees, uh, I could certainly see those being read back into a complaint against the law firm. Um, some of the uh, recent uh, fee award cases uses some language in it that suggests that the losing party um, had a really, really, really bad case. And of course, the losing party itself isn't going to blame themselves for having a really bad case. They're going to blame their lawyers for taking on such a really bad case and for not telling them that they had a really bad case because they would have saved a lot of money. So for example, there's the National Oil Well case from the Federal Circuit earlier this year where the fees, where the Federal Circuit said the case was quote unquote extremely weak. Um, case from the Northern District of Illinois, which said that uh, that the, the the plaintiff was grossly negligent. When we talk about neg negligence is the standard for malpractice. They said grossly negligent because the, the plaintiff clearly lacked standing to bring the case, and they awarded attorney's fees. And then one of my favorites, I think it is my favorite, any of you familiar with Judge Gilstrap from the Eastern District of Texas? Judge Gilstrap, I believe, at least until the fee, uh, until the uh, venue cases have come out, I believe at, at, at a certain point in time, Judge Gilstrap personally handled something like a third of all U.S. patent infringement cases in the United States himself. Um, it's an extraordinarily large number. That's just on Gilstrap's docket, and Gilstrap says, this is the clearest example of an ex exceptional case I have ever seen. <laughs> so if you got someone like Gilstrap who's saying that, you know, you might want to you might want to call your uh, your malpractice carrier and see if this might be a potential claim. Um, so we're uh, we'll get down to, to near the end here and I want to I've got a, a, f a few minutes left. Um, what are some of the takeaways that we have from from our two hours together? Well, you know, there's a lot that we can we can take away. Some of the big issues are, uh, I'm sure you've heard these before, but uh, avoid tinkering, 
Junkering gets us into a lot of problems if we get into a space we're not comfortable with. Um, fee splitting has become a, a, we didn't really get into the fee splitting issue. It was something that came up in that Michael Ova case. But fee splitting is a bugaboo with the OED. They're getting really, a, uh, they're really going after law firms who are, and this happens in this patent space, especially where law firms um, send out overflow work to independent contractor, you know, usually sole practitioners, patent agents, to do to handle their overflow work, and they don't get approval from the client. They don't talk to the client about get. They don't get the client's consent. Um, so the law firm will get, let's say, uh, you know, uh, seventy five hundred dollars to do a utility patent application for a client. Law firm sees it as overflow work. They send it to Joe Smith, who they've got a great relationship with. Joe Smith bills the firm two grand to draft up a nice utility application. Uh, the firm uh, has netted out 5,500 for you know essentially maybe doing nothing other than dressing up Joe Smith's work. Um, that's called fee splitting, and it's and it's unethical unless you have uh, you, you meet a, a test which requires the client to know about it, to consent to it, and that the fees have to be in proportion to the work that is provided by each side, or both parties have to jointly and severally be responsible for the entire matter. And a lot of the fee splitting cases that I deal with, there's a, there's, there's a lot of outsourcing of, of patent application work with no client knowledge or consent, and the law firms themselves are, don't, have, have actually been, not realized that there was an issue. Um, but it's a big deal. Um, robust conflict checking system from the Malin case. Remember, whatever robust is, you must have it. Um, I'm not sure what it is, but it has to be robust. Um, uh, you know, we all make up mistakes. One of the things I've seen is, is the doubling down on the mistake and tripling down on the mistake because I've had cases where clients of mine have um, unfortunately tried to cover up their um, uh, uh, bad actions, and the cover-up is is truly worse than the crime. Um, and when the when the cover-up gets uncovered, um, it's pretty much game set and match. And and what, then we're looking at you know not just how, whether you're getting suspended, but how long and whether you'll ever be able to get your license back again. Um, so. You know, whether you're dealing with your client, whether you're communicating with your client, whether you're communicating with the bar, um, you know, the duty of candor counts. And if you make a mistake, you know, like look at the Sidley and Austin case. I mean, that had to be a very uncomfortable conversation between the managing partner at Sidley and Austin and the general counsel at at and I'm sure he came with a check in hand or something to that effect. But... You know, when, if you mess something up, you've got to own it. And uh, the words to the wise, uh, if you get in a fee dispute with your client, then it does happen, and it's painful to walk away from. Um, but I've seen a lot of fee dispute cases turn into malpractice cases and or um, grievances filed with the OED. And so clients really have us, right? They have a lot of leverage whether they realize it or not. Um, and you've got to think about, is that $100,000 bill that they've stiffed us on worth it? Because we know we're going to get a, you, there's like 90% certainty that you're going to get countersued for malpractice. It's just, it would be malpractice not to countersue for malpractice. And in, in many cases too, these, the, 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 the plaintiffs or the clients who don't pay their bills also ramp up the pressure by filing an ethics complaint against the law firm. So think about, you know, you're, you're really ticked off because you're not getting paid the, however much your, your, your client owes you. You sue them because you feel like you deserve the money. Then you've got to deal with a countersuit for malpractice that you've got to inform your carrier about, and then you have to deal with that. And then, you know, you, to, the, to make everything worse, they, they file an ethics grievance against you, and then you've got the OED coming after you and, and asking questions. And you're like, I've been in, I've counseled many clients in this situation where the lesson is at the end of the day, you know, 
we probably shouldn't have filed that lawsuit for the fees. But again, it's easy for me to say, you know, we're talking about real money. Um, but uh, it's something that really needs to be thought about carefully. And um, um, what else? Um, uh, the, the other issue that comes up all of the time is uh, the, the systems in place for our IP practices, having uh, having a real strong supervisory support team of non-practitioners and practitioners, um, having multiple redundancies in place so that things don't slip through the cracks, because that's the biggest risk that one of the biggest risks that the malpractice carriers look at when they're investigating our own practices are what do you do to have your docket under control? How do you avoid having dates slip through the cracks? What are your systems? How strong are those systems? How have they been tested? Um, those are really important. That's why we're in such a high risk. From a, a liability standpoint, we're in a, in a, in a fairly high risk area. Um, and one final note I would add is um, Consider in your agreements with your clients, if you have engagement agreements with your client, you might want to consider throwing in a binding arbitration clause. Uh, if you do end up getting into a dispute with your client at the end of the day, um, oftentimes it's better not to have that stuff aired out in public. That doesn't do the law firm usually any reputational good. And uh, if you write it up the right way, it's an enforceable part of the agreement. Um, so it's something to consider. So with that, um, You've got my uh, two hours now, and uh, any questions, email them to me. <laughs>